so the the truth about water is that it, it uh, water policy doesn't work without the politics and so because of that we have uh, two experts joining us here today uh, immediately to my right is Pancho Navarra's state representative from district 74 he's in his third term I believe uh, as a state representative and he's on the natural resources committee and if you don't know how um, politics works in Austin, the natural resources, the House Natural Resources Committee is really the water committee where most of the, those policies uh, come from. Uh, some things to note about the representative is that uh, he, he spent some time at that little school up the road in Austin, uh, <laughs> but he did spend some time at Texas A&M International as well and then got his, uh, uh, his law degree from St. Mary's in 1999. Um, to his right is uh, Representative Dade Phelan, and the thing that I have in common with Representative Phelan is that um, I guess it's your uncle, Dr. Phelan's house backed up to my house when I grew up in Beaumont as a, as a kid. So um, it's always fun getting to do work with Representative Phelan because I feel like I'm hearing, hearing about my, my hometown, uh, which I am, um, every time he's, he's telling me about the issues that are going on. Um, Representative Phelan's in... Uh, I guess uh, your second term right now, and uh, he is um, he's also on the Natural Resources Committee, uh, so he's been involved in water policy as well at the legislative level, but he's also on the um, the SWIFT, uh, I guess it's the, the, the SWIFT um, Advisory commi Committee that, that oversees the SWIFT Fund, so he's involved with that, and he also has nine years on a river authority. Um, was also president of a river authority at one point in his career. So uh, the two guys sitting here know uh, water policy probably as good or better than most members of the legislature, and we're, we're, um, we're happy to have them here sitting next to us. Um, so without further ado, when I reached out to him and I said, what do you guys want, how do you guys want to run this? Do you want me to put together a PowerPoint? And uh, I got crickets on that. And the... Uh, they said, well, I want it, they said, you know, being that we're from UT, we'd really like it, like it to be like we're sitting around and people are just watching us have a conversation while we're enjoying tea together. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, I, I can take that idea, but it, pr it probably needs to be like we're sitting around at the chicken having a beer uh, at A&M. Uh, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> so, so anyway, um, so we are going to have just a conversation today. I've got a bunch of loaded questions here that I'm going to pitch to them. Um, some of them might be softballs, and some of them are a little bit more pointed. Uh, so I'm just going to start asking questions, and we're just going to have a conversation up here, hopefully a candid conversation that um, sort of pulls the veil back a little bit on uh, what these guys are thinking as things are moving through the legislature. So without further ado, I'm going to get started. And the first thing I, I, I want to ask about is, your districts are very different um, from a geographic standpoint and kind of where they are. Um, Representative, yours is really sort of on the border, some would say very dry, and Representative Phelan, yours is, would say, water rich in, in deep East Texas. And so the question I have about that is, how does Texas law, in your mind, account for both? Does it do it well? And could we do it better, or does it does it work for different parts of the state that you represent? I, uh, well, I'll say this: we have. Uh, can everybody hear me? And by the way, thank you for sticking around. I, I thought it was just going to be our moms that were going to be here by this point, but I appreciate <laughs> it. The, um, you know, we we have a lot of groundwater in my district. That's really the 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 game, if you will, out in my district. I've got 45,000 square miles. It's the largest house district in the United States. It sits in two time zones and it probably sits on two of the biggest freshwater aquifers, you know, anywhere and then one that's a little more brackish. And so the challenges that we have regarding water and how policy is then and now are somewhat different than what the vice chairman has simply because they deal with more surface water. And we're going to discuss, I think, surface water a little more in depth. But I'll, I'll tell you that it's not the same issues about the actual movement of the water apply to surface water. And I'm not talking about the rules. I'm talking about the feelings, which sometimes get in the way of what the rules are. 
uh, not sometimes, they always get in the way of what the rules are. And uh, I, I think that as we move forward, you know, generally speaking from 30,000 feet up, there has to be some real changes on, on how we view our responsibilities to the different regions and maybe even looking at uh, changing the regions. You know, when you have a groundwater district, they're confined to, you know, the county line. Well, water doesn't respect the county line. It moves wherever it needs to move. And so I, it just makes sense that, and it, granted, when I first got elected, that idea made sense and then it didn't make sense and now it makes sense again. So make sense of that. <laughs> Toby, uh, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, if you're challenging me to a beer drinking contest, I'll be happy to take you up on that. Um, I was in a fraternity at UT, so I, I learned to do a few things. Um, but no, Toby and I, yeah, we, we, do, we both were former staffers in the Senate as well. Uh, I worked for Tommy Williams, who I think started out the, um, this morning. Was Tommy? I believe he was here this morning. I worked for Senator Williams for six years before I moved back to Beaumont and started having babies. And, and uh, I've got four boys under nine, so I've got, I got to stop having those babies pretty soon. But <laughs> I think we figured it out what's causing it. It's that beer drinking, I guess. But, um, but no... Um, yeah, I mean, I, Toby, Toby did an excellent job uh, on the BP oil spill um, distribution. If that's when we first kind of started working together. Um, he was tasked with that from the governor's office, and, of course, southeast Texas was impacted by the oil spill um, over uh, off the coast of Louisiana. So that's when we first started working together, but um, I appreciate being here. Uh, my district is entirely different than, uh, than Representative Navarro's. I can tell you that um, he has, I believe, six of the smallest states in the United States would fit inside his district. That's how big it is. <laughs> and I'm on the border, too, but it's the Louisiana border. So uh, he's on the U.S.-Mexico border. I'm the Louisiana border. But I've got a county and a half. I've got all of Orange County, and I have half of Jefferson County. And that is basically both offices of the Sabine River Authority and the Lower Nature's Valley Authority are in my district. And those are the uh, Toledo Bend, which we share with Louisiana. People forget that. I mean, we we'll talk about some of that today, but... We, sh we share Toledo Bend with Louisiana, and uh, so I have Toledo Bend, and I have Lake Sam Raven water coming down to my district. And I spent nine years on the uh, Lower Nation Valley Authority, had to get off once I won my primary, but um, I would say I'm in probably the most water-rich district in the United States. I don't know if anyone has as much water as, as my district does, but let me tell you why, that ma why it matters to me that uh, we're very sensitive as to how we change surface water uh, rights and that is um, all you drove here uh, you use gasoline and it probably came from my district um, the tires in your car probably came from my district if you were if there's anything plastic in your life it probably was formulated in my district and all that uses water lots and lots of water and while you may go see Toledo Bend and you may go see Lake Sam Raven in the summer on vacation you see all this water that water is actually contracted. Someone has a right to that water. And it is the, some of the largest refineries in the world, certainly in North America, um, and we hope they get bigger. And they do have plans. To get There's $30 billion in the pipeline for expansion in Southeast Texas. It would not be there if they didn't have access to water. So unlike groundwater, we, we look at um, surface water based on basins. So if a drop of water hits the the um, nature's basin, it ends up in the nature's river. So it follows much more than I would say a groundwater where it, you use county lines. And when I was uh, appointed to, when I was named at Vice Chair of National Resources, I brought in Ty Embry, a, number four, a former staffer who's an expert in groundwater. And I said, tell me everything you know about groundwater because I don't have a single one of them in my district. And I would say 80% of what we fought over last session was groundwater. So it's a big issue. I'm sensitive to it. I've a lot, I have a lot to learn about it. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, there, there are two entirely different subjects, and it, both extremely sensitive. So. so along the lines of sort of balancing those differences in the geography of your districts, can you guys and, and talk about sort of the urban-rural uh, balance that has to be struck in the legislature as y'all are looking at, uh, at policies regarding water? You know, you, you talk about uh, from a surface water perspective, and I, I was – I was trying to remember, I think it was Senate Bill 1 or Senate Bill 2 back in 97 that basically uh, created the rules that we follow regarding interbasin transfers and, and how 
and I think this will answer your question or maybe confuse us more than we already are when it comes to water, but we saw a lot of movement in the last two sessions with bills aimed at relaxing the ability to transfer water, and not so much the water itself, but the right. And so if you look at what the rules created in 97, it created an opportunity for somebody to sell, you know, right A from the basin where the water originates to somebody who may want it in, in basin B, I use A and B. But what it also did is it created, once the sale was consummated, the person that bought it didn't have, it's like, I remember in law school, we get taught that when you buy something, you buy a whole bundle of sticks. Well, when you buy, you know, an uh, interbasin transfer or a water right from interbasin, you're not buying the whole bundle of sticks. Your, your sticks have now diminished, and your right is now, they call it a junior right. Uh, popularly, they call it a junior right. So, you know, you can't, and I was telling the commissioner this before we got on stage, is whether you believe, you can't believe that that was a unintended consequence. I mean, it was intended to make it more difficult and make these deals unattractive, and there's a reason for that, is in times of abundance, you don't want, you don't want people that have had these rights for a long time to now have to take a back seat to basically, you know, a, I use the word carpetbagger because in water there's a lot of carpetbaggers too. Uh, and so I, going forward, I know we've had, and I, I don't want to call them a tax, but we've had attempts to change the rules and relax them so that these transfers can become easier. And I think you're seeing communities that are what I would call uh, suburban counties or smaller cities outside of the urban areas that are very urbanized as well that really want this to to go their way and it you know the it's really based in North Texas this type of movement but I I would suspect that you know Dade would not appreciate it based on what he just laid out regarding how important the water is in East Texas and why it has to be difficult for or it should be difficult for someone who buys the right to then just step right into the shoes of the person that sold them. And so I, I think that that's, that's one when we're talking about surface water among many things. Well, he, he couldn't have said it better. Um, when I ran for office, you know, as we all do, we go knock doors and you ask voters what's important to them. And of course, uh, you know, my first, order, my first door I knocked on, they said, you're gonna get rid of Obamacare. I said, well, that's not really what I'm, I'm not going to Washington, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, second door, you can get rid of Obama. By the third door, I was like, I'm going to get rid of Obama. <laughs> um, I am your man, vote date. Um, but it's actually, it's actually pretty, it's, it was pretty telling to see how many folks at the door were in tune to water rights and, and protect our water, protect our water. Because why? Because they had a Nomax jumpsuit on. They worked at Total or, or they worked at Valero or they worked at... Uh, Sunoco. So they know that their job depends on the water coming down those rivers. And, it, it, and I could go over to Orange County, it'd be the same thing. It could be Dow Chemical, it could be DuPont, you name it. They know that, that water is what puts food on the table and puts their kids to, you know, college education to be paid for with, um, with that water. So it, it's, it's very obviously, it's a third rail in my district to talk about junior water rights. But um, one of the misconceptions some of my urban friends have is that this is a new thing. This is something that happened in 97, 98, or this is something that happened 30 years ago. It's always been, it's always been the, um, I wouldn't say the statute, but the practice of Texas that you cannot discriminate against uh, the base, the origin of, uh, the basin of origin. So if you are, if you live in the Nature's River Basin, then you are not to be discriminated against by someone who lives outside that basin if they want that water. They are junior. That's been the law for 150 years. If you're outside the basin, you're junior to those inside the basin. Now, was that put in the statute back then? No, but that was always a practice. So when we finally put it in the statute, some think that's the first time it existed, and that's not the case. It's how we've always always treated uh, waters in, within our uh, river basins. As, and if you live there, then you have priority to it because that's your homestead, and that's still the case. Now, nowadays, it's, uh, it's more important, not necessarily because your homestead or for your cattle, although that still occurs in my district, it's, it's petrochemical and it's refining. Um, and it's, it's LNG, it, it's a new industry that's popping up. I've, I've got a um, Exxon Mobil um, Golden Pass LNG that's gonna be coming online soon and they're gonna need a tremendous amount of water. Do you think, I know that there's been um, bills filed specifically to try to get rid of that junior provision requirement. Do you foresee that happening again this session? Um, do you ever see, do you ever see it it changing 
as far as uh, interbasin transfers go? I mean, you, you can never say never, but I think, you know, I kind of laid it out, and I think they sliced it up really good in getting to that part of it is because that idea of discrimination and what it means, I mean, it's been litigated a lot. And, uh, you know, as a lawyer, I put my lawyer cap on, I look at some of the results of that, and they, they tend to echo what Dade says. And in other words, it's not, this is not a new concept. And so you're talking about changing. Think about that is it's been the practice and not really inscribed in the statute before 97, yet nothing about it moved, uh, you know, substantially or, or even, you know, it really didn't move if you look at the history of the case law. And so these things take a long time, but I do think this is that there's going to be more attempts. I mean, we saw them in the last session. But I, I think if you ask me, you know, right now, gun to my head, if we had all the members of the committee up here and we had to take a vote on whether we're going to uh, change, you know, what a junior right means and, and take away the junior from it and call it a right, I'd say no, it's a loser. Um, I, I don't really see what, again, the makeup of the committee will determine a lot of that, but let's just say the committee stays more or less the way it is now, and I think there's a reason that it, it is the way it is, and I think it's a, that committee to me is a really good example of the checks that we need on this issue because it's so important. I'm not trying to say that myself or Dade are that much more versed or more important to the issue of water, but it just seems that um, because of where we're from, the, these nuances are not lost on us, if, if that makes sense. And so I just don't see that happening. I can say it, it would certainly be attempted. Uh, my freshman session, 85th, the only individual who really filed a true um, junior uh, interbasin transfer bill was the gentleman who ran against the speaker and lost. And so, I, obviously that bill was not going anywhere. Um, he didn't pass any bills that session, uh, much less that one. This past cycle there was, there was a bill and the author was, he was very passionate about it. It, it, it specifically impacted his district in the bill it impacted his district. The caption said, relating to the interbasin transfer powers or something along those lines. Yeah. When you get to the House floor, that bill could be amended to every single interbasin transfer in the state of Texas would be germane to that title. It didn't say an interbasin transfer in a county bordering so-and-so with a population. It wasn't bracketed to a specific geographical. It applied to the entire state of Texas. So it didn't even get a vote in the committee. That was the only real attempt last cycle. Had that caption been more uh, specific, there may have been members who would want to help that individual do what he needed to do in his district. But was that a wolf in sheep clothing? Maybe. I mean, maybe they wanted to get it to the floor to where it could open up to every single in basin transfer that could be comp contemplated in the state of Texas. So if that's the case, I'm sorry, if you have an issue in your district, it's, it's not going to pass because we can't risk that in certain areas of the state. And it's a comprehensive it's a discussion we have to have through the interim. And we get yeah. to really dive deep, deep. It's not something to fight on the floor. You know, the, the funny thing, Dade, is that, I mean, my memory serves me correct, is, and, and by the way, Dade and I served on calendars also last session. So yeah. there's always this discussion about letting a bill out of committee just to kind of let it go. And then maybe, you, you know, we can cool it somehow or make it, make it bulletproof. But the truth is, and, and Dade's exactly right, is you cannot, that thing will become a, it would have become a wagon for all kinds of desires and hopes that people have about water. And some of them are, in my opinion, uh, uninformed. And so that's a danger is mm -hmm. there's some bills that catch fire on the floor. And then I, I don't know, there's some, there's some representatives that you don't have a lot of confidence. And not, I say not a lot of confidence that they're not gonna be able to keep other people from amending the bill. They're just not gonna be able to do it. And if you don't, you know, if you don't have that confidence, then there's no, <laughs> there's no point in having to yeah. vote on it because that thing could blow up. And I, I remember uh, the discussion was, well, why don't we, you know, bring it up in the committee, have a vote on it, and let it go to calendars. And, you know, yeah, we're on calendars, but at that point, that's one more out of a thousand fires you got to put out. Mm -hmm. And they're all burning at the same time, so, what, you know, pick one. Sure. And sure. so, yeah, are, are we going to talk about it? Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. yeah, we call them Christmas trees. I mean, yeah. You get out there on the floor and everyone gets to hang a little ornament on there that, that means something to them. At the end of the day, it's a pretty ugly tree. Um, so we, at, at that point, you know, if we're all sympathetic. You know, this yeah. Huge state, diverse needs when it comes to water, no doubt about it. We're all sympathetic to what every member needs in their district. 
But when you throw out something like that, that could have an unbelievable, I mean, it could re reverse 150 years of how we practice. It, it, can't, it, it can't get to the floor. It, it would have been a, if it had gone out and passed, it would have been a Thunderbolt, oh. Titanic, <laughs> Thor, Hammer, Blast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you pick the, pick it. I mean, it would have been that. Yeah. I mean, there's, an 84 session, there was a water fight. A, a bill broke out yeah. <laughs> over in the North Texas area. And if you, I mean, it's like throwing a match in a, in a swimming pool full of gasoline. When the water fight breaks out on the floor, it's like something I've ever seen. It's awesome, by the way. <laughs> but I mean, it's really, really cool to watch because everyone takes their jacket off and let's, let's do it. I, you know, I, I, just I was wanting to fight. It didn't even bother. It didn't uh, impact no. me. I wanted to but fight. I was one of those like, I just hate it when mommy and daddy <laughs> fight. I'm going to sit in the corner. <laughs> but uh, it, they're yeah, ugly. You know, so they're along ugly. those lines, could I ask you a little bit to help us understand? I don't know if everyone really understands the the way the, the politics work there, but it's not just sort of r rural versus urban or geographic areas. The other thing is that you've got the House, the Senate, and the governor's office all playing at the same time during a legislative session. Could you guys help us understand maybe how that, how that works a little bit? and how you work with the other house and with the uh, and with the governor's office as you're trying to formulate these these policies. I, I'd like to say that I'm objective about this, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, I don't know why, I just get the sense that we know a lot more about water in the house, meaning maybe on the committee than the Senate does. <laughs> but uh, I, I, and I, I say it like this because, and I guess to answer your question, I think we work well to the extent that we understand what everybody's doing, but I think there's always a disconnect with, uh, you know, the Senate, the governor's office, and our house, and in particular our committee on exactly how we're going to do things, because a lot of things that seem to roll very quick in the Senate, and in this last session, things rolled really, really quick in the Senate, so all this stuff's coming. In addition, uh, there was a, a two or three bills that came out of the Senate whatever passes for natural resources in the Senate. I don't know what the name is, but <laughs> I should know that, but I don't. Um, who cares, right? <laughs> the, uh, but, and it, it, you know, and it's one of these things that we're just kind of like, whoa, we've got other things that we're going to work on. Uh, you know, that bill may not get a hearing just yet. We've got X, Y, and Z. And, you know, that always causes a little friction, and no more so than a, than a subject like water. And I just, I, I had to laugh because towards the end of the session, you know, we pretty much knew how everything was going to end up. I mean, in terms of those bills, and you can script those, you didn't know what was going on in other areas, but we kept getting these pushes from the Senate and the governor's office on these bills, and it's like, you know, find something else to do, because this is not going to happen. And from a political standpoint, I don't know if past the different regions, it's uh, some sort of political, you know, kryptonite, but at least for me, you know, where I live, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious and careful of looking at these things that would affect, you know, like Forest District. You know, there was a bill that was carried by a senator up there that would really affect the aquifer and, uh, and really change how groundwater districts operate. And, and so, again, being from a place where, you know, groundwater districts exist, whether people like them or not, they're there. And, and we made some changes to the way groundwater districts operate, but again, they weren't uh, earth shattering. But I guess long story long and before Dave jumps in is, there's a Senate and they file bills. <laughs> well, I think Poncho is completely correct. I mean, how many rural senators are there left? I mean, if you look at the Senate, they're all anchored in urban areas. Yeah. They may have rural, they have counties that are rural, absolutely, but they may, you know, uh, I think there's maybe one or two out of 31 that are truly, you could say that's a, that is a rural senator. I mean, I got to walk to town to hunt. I mean, that's why I live yeah. out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the house is completely different. We have real rural representation in the house, and I mean, I know where my water comes from. My my constituents know where their water comes from. The, my rice farmers know all about water. That's that's the one of the biggest, uh, most important aspects of their job is water and when they get it, how they get it, and how long they have it. And uh, first crop, second crop, you name it. And uh, of course, my petrochemical and refining. I've already talked about that. We all know where our water comes from. And no offense to anyone who's from a large city, but you just turn on the tap and it comes out, right? You don't know where it comes from. Well, that's how I think the Senate, most of their voters don't, they don't, the water's an afterthought to them. Yeah. It's not an afterthought in the rural Texas. So I just don't think that it is a priority for most senators because of where they're from and the majority of who they represent. 
And as this state becomes more and more urban and suburban, it's be more of a challenge for Poncho and I to keep the rural areas of Texas represented in, in, a, in a fair manner. And the House is really the last bastion of rural representation. I just, that, I, 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 think agree. That's, I think the Senate would agree with that. I agree, and I think that, you know, somebody was asking me about that, and I think there's, you know, there's a very good, you know, the good thing about being a rural representative is somehow even urban and suburban reps have this romantic idea that they are also rural representatives. <laughs> and I feed that, like, Dayton, yeah. yes, you are, of course yeah. you are. <laughs> and, uh, and because not, you know, those things kind of, and I, I really think as the state grows and changes, more of the fights will be urban versus rural and how you can, you know, because a lot of things, you know, we become strange bedfellows in, that, in those issues, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. By the way, I'm the Democrat on the panel, <laughs> you're but, uh, but when it comes to water, I really don't have any religion, and that's the truth. And that should probably be for a lot of the things that we do, but in particular when it comes to water. But I think, you know, the challenge that Dayton and I have, and I think it's when I compare, and I, I don't, I don't want to say that other representatives are more ignorant about the issue because they're urban, but I think because they deal in a lot of issues with water that sometimes we don't, meaning the, the quality of it and uh, the, the availability, if you will, for a lot of their constituency, but so do we, and we deal with it from the get to the go, meaning when it, where it's coming from and how it ends up. And so I think we see our responsibility a little bit more broad uh, or broader. And I know Dade does this and I do too, is we're always trying to win converts. And it's real easy because again, a lot of these people wanna believe that they are part of like, you know, with a little stray, uh, straw coming out of their mouth and, you know, riding a horse. And then, I mean, great. If that's the way you feel, welcome to the team. <laughs> yeah, I, I was on Twitter the other day and I saw one of our suburban counterparts with a cowboy hat on. I was like, <laughs> where is the price tag? <laughs> it probably ended up in a he was at, Yeah, I was like, uh, you got a gift shop? I, you know, you got a Copenhagen can full of bubble gum. And, I think he was wearing uh, it backwards too. Yeah, exactly. He probably was wearing it backwards. But yeah, they, they think that they have like a half acre house that, that, that now they're you know they're What's they're it? rural What's they're rural too, now too much to mow and not enough to grow anything. exactly exactly yeah. um yeah there is a romantic that i was thought out there that they all want to be rural because you know it's like you got like 35 starbucks in your district you're not rural <laughs> i mean <laughs> sorry um so i want to I, I know that <laughs> this is really about surface water but uh representative navarez i know that you, you you've mentioned groundwater conservation districts a couple times and so I Did can't, I? I I can't help but that. asking the question, um, do you feel like that groundwater conservation districts are the appropriate way to manage groundwater, and do you ever foresee a change in how, in how groundwater is managed? I, I think that yes and no. In other words, I, I don't see a better way to do it right now. I mean, there's, you know, there's some things that were done last session that I think were needed to, to allow for a better evaluation of a permit, of the permit process, I think. And that's not a bad thing, but I just don't see, you know, until something magical comes along. And you know, I, I've thought about it a lot, and I, I think about my my place in that debate and uh, where I would end up. And I'm not being facetious on this, I'm just thinking about like uh, where I would end up in this discussion about what I could do for our state when it comes to water. And it's important to me to the extent that I'd be involved in the conversation positively and that the things that we do actually have a lasting impact. And, uh, you know, I think, and I wasn't involved, I was involved in it tangentially, you know, two sessions ago in our uh, SWIFT fund thing, but I think over the course of the last two sessions, I've had a bigger hand in it and I, I appreciate the opportunity and I, I, I see that, like what, what can I do in this to ensure that we do it better? And when you talk about groundwater districts, I, I really look at that. And it's not so much getting rid of them and saying, you know, hey, uh, let's have a free for all on groundwater. I'm, re I'm real sympathetic to the to the idea that you know it's a private uh, property right, and it should be marketed and sold, you know, uh, depending on the need. And we have so many different views on what the need is and what exists. And you know, I remember, and I was telling. Uh, I was having a conversation, I can't. I was having a conversation right now in the back, and uh, we, uh, I, you know, I pointed out the fact that at a committee hearing that we had in an area in my district, you know, the, the idea of where the water goes should not come into effect when you're talking about a permit. It shouldn't matter. What should matter is, you know, can we afford to pump it out, and is there enough water to satisfy the, the contract? That's it, really, you know, and is it not going to diminish somebody else to, to a lesser extent? But 
it keeps coming up in these debates, well, where's the water going? Well, it shouldn't matter if it's going a foot past the county line or a million miles away. Like, once you decide that you have enough water to move, you know, it should be the landowner's right and the person that markets it, market it right to send it wherever they want. You know, if they want to put it in a barrel and look at it, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's, and I wouldn't recommend that, but I mean, you can do that. And so, I, you know, my, my job in this is, I think, and if, it's, if there's going to be a lasting, and I don't want to say legacy, because I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not anywhere good enough or great enough to be considered that in any shape or form in the legislature, and I mean that sincerely, is if I can get people to think that it's okay to, for water to move under the right circumstances and don't worry about where it goes, it's gonna go somewhere where people need it. And that's more or less the truth. And we shouldn't have a problem with that. At the same time, we shouldn't, in moving water, you know, we shouldn't undo all the practices that we have because some of them are pretty good. And I'm not anybody, and I, I'm not anybody to come say, you know what? I'm here now, let me pull a pin on this grenade, and let's blow this stuff up, and let's get it done a different way. I, well, I'm not, you know, and I, I'll tell you, our chairman on the committee, Lyle, you know, he knows more water, he probably knows more about water than a bass does. I mean, it's just, it's true. You know, he's probably half bass, I think. <laughs> and, um, and, he, and he's got some ideas that, you know, sometimes they clash with some of the things that I think about regarding groundwater, and I know they clash sometimes with some of the ideas that some of the guys, you know, east of me believe regarding uh, surface water. and. But it's, you know what? It's good. Those conversations are good. And even when they get heated and, uh, you know, like Dade says, we're peeling our jackets off on the floor because we're going to bust some heads, it's, <laughs> it's still fun. <laughs> so, uh, so several sessions ago, there was a bill passed that identified 19 reservoir sites across the state of Texas and said this is the place where we're going to build them if we ever build them. And the question I have for you guys is are we ever going to build them? No. We I, I mean, what is the, anyone, is anyone in here going to be an attorney or wants to be an attorney? Okay. You didn't raise your hand very high. All right. <laughs> well, Poncho is. I can tell you the, the Endangered Species Act is something like 164 to zero. It's never been beat. So if you want to go build a reservoir, someone's going to go find an insect, an animal, a plant, and say, not here. I just don't, I just don't see it happening. And if you look at the cost, of in today's dollars, what it would build, you know, take to build a reservoir 25 years from now. Does that make any sense? I mean, I, our forefathers did an excellent job uh, of, you know, there are no natural lakes in Texas, saving except one. <coughs> Everything else is a reservoir. They did an excellent job when they, when they could do it, and they could do it then. And it's, uh, the politics now just don't allow for it. Washington, uh, it's just too much of it. between the Corps of Engineers and U.S. U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Endangered Species Act. My great great grandchildren, you know, may have a shovel in their hand one day, but I just don't see it. it I mean, you know, Dade's right. There's just, and I don't really, it doesn't really matter, I think, if uh, the ideology in Washington changes one way or the uh -huh. other, regard, it's not going to matter. There's just, it's one of those issues. And I, I mean, if, if you want to direct resources towards reservoirs, let's look at the ones that we have already. Uh, I mean, there's some things that you can do with those to make them a little bit more, and I use the word profitable, but yeah, I mean, profitable in the sense of being able to store water. You know, make them deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, close the circumference a little bit so that you have less surface exposed to, to evaporation. And you know, one of the things that's lamentable about the floods, and you know, uh, Lyle Larson's been a big champion of this, is uh, underground storage of, of water when it rains. And I mean, I, you know, you want to talk about a tragedy on top of a tragedy. I mean, not diminishing what happened to the people and their property, but you know, seeing all that the push of water that, that was going out into the Gulf that we just could not get our hands on. Literally, that's sad. Uh, and we, you know we're starting to get into a drought situation again, and uh, you know those are the things that we need to be doing, I think, because they're realistic. Uh, you're not going to have as much uh, uh, as much pressure popping back at you, but uh, you know Dade's 100% right. Like, no. Well, let me add to that real fast, if you don't mind. One, no other state west of the Mississippi has a reservoir in their water plan, other than Texas. We're the only ones even contemplating. Everyone else has pretty much given up. Uh, but you bring up Harvey, and since I had had a whole lot of fun with Harvey, um, let me just add some yeah some crazy numbers. So, because we, we talked about the aquifer restore, um, recharges and, and storage and recovery, which uh, Chairman Larson had a bill that was vetoed. Um, Imagine that. Yeah. So we, we we can't study that over the interim, or we can't do much work on it. But. Um, they say, depending on who you look at, 34 trillion gallons of water fell on the Texas Gulf Coast during Harvey. Now, 
typically it fell in about a 72 hour period depending on where you were. Now, I now have the, the uh, privilege, so to speak, of representing the area of the United States with the highest rainfall total ever in 72 hours at 64.57 inches of rain wow. in three days. That beat the Honolulu record of 50 inches in 1950. There are some in Southeast Texas who think the rainfall total was actually closer to 70, but the gauges went out after 64 and a half. They stopped working and it kept raining. So let's just say it was somewhere around 34 trillion, all right? If you, that is 1.16 million gallons for every man, woman, and child that lives in the state of Texas right now. That is 36.7 years worth of water based on the Water Development Board's numbers of 89 gallons a day. That's 36.7 years worth of fresh water for every man, woman, and child living in the state of Texas right now. It all went out into the Gulf, gone. Couldn't use it. If we could just grab a small portion of that, just a small portion of that in our large, especially in our large urban areas, we can go a long way um, in solving our water problems. That's a tremendous amount of water. I, trust me, I lived through it. It was insane. I've never seen anything like it, and I hope I never do again. I don't know if y'all saw Dade's picture on Twitter of a piece of I-10, I'm trying to remember by, where was it at? It was in between uh, Winnie and Beaumont. So it's one of the best pictures, I mean, and that's a relative term, best pictures in the, the flood, but it, I mean, the, the water was almost up to the sign telling you where you were at. I mean, that's how high it was. There were white caps on yeah. I-10. I mean, it looked like you were out there, you know, Steinbeck, old man in the sea type stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it did. Yeah, I mean, boats were going along neighborhoods and hitting the rooftops of F-250s and getting hung up in street signs. Yeah, it was amazing. It was unbelievable. So obviously that, that I asked uh, Representative Navarez about groundwater conservation districts. We're obviously on the topic of surface water now. Um, the, the question I have is um, outside of technology, and moving into things like ASR and desalve brackish water and those sorts of things, which I think we're moving towards. There's also just the, the basic idea of the prior appropriation doctrine. And the question I have is, you know, part of this discussion is about whether we should, how do you build a water market? And with the way the prior appropriation doctrine works, is, would you say that's an appropriate way to manage the surface water that we have do you ever foresee, um, from a legislative perspective, do you ever foresee a change in how how we approach uh, managing that surface water? And I, I I would defer to Dade in terms of, I mean, again, is what's what's going to drive a lot of this is the de where the need comes from. And I mean, you've heard it. I mean, there's no, I think in in committee, I don't think anybody would dispute the fact that any change to uh, to that particular idea or theory regarding our state right now of surface water would impact, you know, probably very negatively a lot of these industries. And so, I mean, I know Dade would take a step back and breathe three or four times real heavy and big, <laughs> and then the rest of us would kind of follow suit. Because look at it like this is if, you know, my issue is a little different regarding groundwater, but I'm extremely sensitive to Dade's issue because I could be the one making the ask next time, like, hey, you know, save, save us from this because the threat to me is no different from the threat to you. It may take a different form, but the outcome's the same. And so, I, I, again, this is just one of those things that I just don't see. I, I see us having more movement, honestly, on groundwater before we have it on surface water. And, and the reason for that is I think there's a more, um, it seems to be more active, and there seems to be more room. I just, I sense that. I sense that there would be more room, not just from the communities themselves, but from the people that are engaged on, on the business end and the landowners. And I, I've seen, you know, even though we were unsuccessful a couple sessions ago to try to get a water, uh, groundwater district in Valverde County, which is uh, Del Rio's the county seat, I still felt that the process and the exercise was uh, fruitful because it allowed everybody to kind of see or have a better idea of what their position is, and I see some some softening, but, and I could be wrong on dates because I don't obviously live in that district, but I, I don't see that over there. I don't, in conversations I've had with people, not just with Dade, but you know, with Trent and guys like that, they're up, further up, and, and the people that live there and actually do business there, I don't see it. So, you know, obviously we're very sensitive to interbasin transfers and junior water rights. That's without, you know, saying. I can tell you that when I was on LNVA, we actually reached out to the Sabine River Authority and we had a project we were working on where we were going to put in a 
29.9 mile conveyance system, pipeline slash open, uh, open canal system to where the, uh, I, can't, I, I can't say we and them anymore because I represent both of them now, but LNVA, us. LNV, us, LNVA was going to purchase water rights or reserve water rights in Toledo Bend so for industry, because industry was growing faster in southern Jefferson County than it was in southern Orange County. And uh, I can tell you that was just 29 miles to go. Uh, very expensive. Uh, this was eight or nine years, maybe seven years ago, quarter of a billion dollars to go 30 miles. All right, that was okay, environmental issues on top of that. All right, now you want to talk about going from Toledo Bend all the way to Dallas? I just, how's that going to happen? All right, and even if even if they wanted to do it, even if they, even even if Toledo Bend, which by the way, is what a lot of folks are looking at, is truly because they do have a million acre feet just on the Texas side. I remind people, Toledo Bend is half owned by the state of Louisiana. The board of directors is half Louisiana, half Texas. Has anyone ever tried to do business with the state of Louisiana I in here? Know. Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah. I have a cousin who's in. The, I have a cousin who's a, a member of the House representing Louisiana. And he has not gone to prison, and he's probably the only one in that house who had. not I'm telling you, they do things so different over there. Um, and I was with the Workforce Commission yesterday talking about how difficult it is for industry to attract talent to Orange County because our, our, it's, they're not competing with Jefferson County or Houston. They're competing with Lake Charles. And Louisiana does whatever they want to do over there. There is no environmental permitting. There is nothing. They just get it done, you know? So uh, trying to strike a deal with the Louisiana side is going to be very, very difficult for any large urban area that thinks they can dip their toe in the Toledo Bend, if you ask me. But there's a cost side to that as well, and there's a time frame that's going to be very problematic. And then, who pays the, for what's called the reservation rights? So they're going to say, well, we want 300,000 acre feet, but we don't want it right now. Just keep it there, hold it for us. What are you going to pay me for that? I can't use it. You need to pay me for sitting there, right? And they'll say, no, 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 we don't, we're not going to pay you until we take it. Right? But that's not going to work. It's like going to a car lot and saying, I want this car, but let it sit there for about a year until I actually need it. That doesn't work. You want to talk about free markets? That's not free market either. So it, you know, it goes both ways. And I think that the price tag for what some want uh, from East Texas is going to be much higher than they think. And, it, and, and the time frames are much longer than they think. But I can tell you there are willing there are willing sellers in East Texas. It's just that it, it can't harm us. We can't open the pipe and never shut it off again. Because, um, like I said, we do have interest down here. 100% of the military jet fuel is made in my district. So if a plane is flying over the Middle East right now, that came from my district. I think we want our planes in the air, if I'm not mistaken. If you cut off the spigot to, to those companies, we have a national you know, uh, defense problem, 12.5% uh, of the diesel that goes to the, east, the northeast comes from southeast Texas. So we can't just forget about where this water goes. And um, I'm sorry, Dallas, all their, I'm, I apologize that all their golf courses are not pristine green, but that's their problem, not mine. Do you think, do you think we'd ever see a bill that would, that would go after that priority doctrine that says the first, you know, the if I, I've got the oldest right on the river, which means I'm the first in line, that would maybe turn that upside down and start to mess with that? I think when you do that, it all falls apart. I think that's like playing Jenga. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, you, you're pulling out the very bottom part and it all falls apart. That, I, that's probably what holds it all together. I'm not a water attorney, but that's at the core of it. Yeah. I mean, you go back kind of maybe closing the circle to where we started and, you know, I think we started talking about you know the junior ride and the intent back in 97 and and then you know they did an awesome job of reminding us all that it's not just the intent in 97 this is something that we've just done and you know there's a reason yeah there's buyers and they mentioned that there's buyers that have water that they're willing to sell it but are you willing to take you know bet on the come and have your the minute you buy it it's automatically less valuable because you're not going to be able to get to it and that's again it to me, that's a question of whether you're, you know, a lot of times in these deals, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. And, I mean, it's <laughs> true. true. And you, you know, I, I've seen deals fall apart where people have been hanging in for 10, 12 years. And really what it is at the end of the day, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. And if you're willing to maybe lessen the deal and make it more palatable for all the different uh, stakeholders, maybe it gets done. 
maybe you, maybe you spend more money up front getting the infrastructure done and not worry so much about getting the contract that you have sold on Wall Street to some investment bank so that you can cash out and mm -hmm. you know buy another yacht or whatever it is you <laughs> want to do with your money. I don't know. Fly to the Caymans. I, by the way, Dave and I have never done that with any money. <laughs> so kidding. can I ask about how you balance? Um, you know, obviously there's a there, there's a, a good um, balance that has to be struck, and I think it's a worthwhile conversation between sort of the human use component of water and the environmental need um, for some of our rivers and uh, bays and estuaries. As you guys are thinking about state policy in these areas, how do you guys balance those two things as you're making your decisions? You know, there, you got to go, I mean, obviously, number one, use of water you know someday maybe and i don't know I, we're probably not going to be alive to see it but someday we may get along without oil and gas someday i just it can happen but we'll never get along without water it's just there's no way uh and so i think it's it's really easy to say well human consumption is number one you know and that, i mean obviously that's a reflexive answer for most people but you know, I, I see examples of municipalities that they're, you know, involved in these groundwater or surface water deals to draw water to their city, and they don't use anywhere near all the water. And so I think, yes, we should cover human consumption, but let's also, again, let's not our eyes get bigger than our stomachs in terms of what we want and when we want it and why we want it. And, you know, it, it can't be that a um, municipal organization or some other group that's using the water for whether it's human consumption or business growth, whatever it may be, that they have more than they need. And, you know, if they can't turn into sellers of water, too, just because they've been over allotted, if that makes sense. And, you know, the taxpayer, you know, I saw a deal where a group was going to come in, um, a city was getting water for free, and they were going to cut a deal for some upfront money to basically give that away and then now pay for the water. And so I'm like, well, how does this work? Because you're getting it for free right now, you know. And even in places where there's no groundwater districts, I tell landowners, well, why don't you just sell water? There's no rules. Pump it, sell it. And the reason is, is people that don't understand the issue, and again, going back to this idea of eyes bigger than your stomach, are saying, no, we want all these guarantees. Well, you know what? There are no guarantees. Because you don't know. I mean, you just don't know. I mean, science tells us that water is going to last X amount of time. And, uh, you know, a lot of those studies are good. But who knows? You know, if maybe if we had been able to capture, you know, all this water, it's a game changer for that. We don't even have this discussion anymore. You know, you can walk around with a hose bathing you 24-7, and it's all good. <laughs> I mean, your skin wouldn't look real good after a while, but I mean, that's, you know. But I, I, again, and I, maybe I'm, I'm getting a little worked up. I get worked up because, yeah, number one should be clean water for human consumption. Because as we go, so does the industries go. But we also have to be mindful of the fact that Sometimes we have to save ourselves from ourselves and not over allot that water because we can still, even though we're not using it ourselves, it can still be used for something else. And it's, you know, we're going we're gonna to reduce the cost of being able to move it. We're going to reduce the cost of having to replace it when it's gone. And, uh, but, you know, again, some of these things, some of these ideas make too much sense. And so I'll tell you again, go make sense of that. Well, this is the part where I brag on TCEQ, but I think Texas does an excellent job with our water. I do. I think TCEQ does an excellent job. and um, I'm not going to go on with an EPA bashing here, but... I've got that $10 okay, for thank you. you. I, I was going to remind you of that. Though. But, um, no, I think, we, I think we do an excellent job in the state of Texas. And in East Texas, I draw from my time on the River Authority, but we were approached with an um, you know, in-stream flows committee recommendation from a, a group of... It was a mix of, of environmentalists and industry, whatever, but conservationists. And the amount of water they wanted to go into the bays and estuaries in southeast Texas was basically all of it. I mean, that was their proposal. Like, stop using all of this water. It, it, there, was nothing, there was nothing currently going on in the bays and estuaries in southeast Texas that they were concerned about. But this report said, send it all down here. It can't hurt. Well, all right. Well, actually, it can hurt. You, you can have too much fresh water in a, in a brackish uh, environment. But, uh, and then there was another group that got a little traction. They were, um, oh, what's his name from the Eagles? Uh, the lead singer? What's Don Henley. Don Henley got behind this group, and they were going around. And their ultimate goal was to get rid of dams. 
let all the rivers go back to their natural state. And that was in the middle of a drought. And I wanted, we, were at a, we were at a hearing, and I said, you want to know the natural state of, of the Nature's River and the Sabine River right now? You'd be dragging your kayak behind you with a rope because it would be dry. There would be no water in the river right now if it were not for those dams and reservoirs. There's water right now because of the dam. I mean, if, if you want to, and it was a kayak group that I was giving a hard time to, but they wanted to be able to kayak down the river. It's like, you can right now. You wouldn't if there weren't a dam. But, so there obviously is a balance, and, and we have to be sensitive to that. Um, I think sometimes groups, like I said, they overprescribe. They ask for more than they could ever want. But we, uh, I think locally, the river authorities have done an excellent job. I, I have no complaints with the surface water management as far as the, from an environmental standpoint. Um, they know when to, for instance, um, rice farmers, I've benefited in my district because all the rice farmers are moving to southeast Texas because they can't get, they make all their money off of second crops. Yeah. First, first crop's great, second crop's where they make their profit. Can't grow a second crop, they're not, they're not farming in your region. So they're all moving to east Texas because we can guarantee a second crops. And organic rice, we can get, uh, we, organic rice uses a lot of water. So we can, we can guarantee those things. Um, but they were shut off from the Colorado and the Brazos because you can't grow, because the, the environment, the basin estuaries needed that water, you cannot use it for rice farming. And that was, that was not a state issue really, those were the local river authorities making that call. So I, th I think the locals are best at doing it. This is their community. They're obviously concerned about it. I'm a fisherman. I'm on the board of CCA. I don't want to see anything happen to Sabine. Um, so obviously, I think that locally, they're doing an excellent job. Uh, it's a big task, but it's, it, they're far more sophisticated than people give them credit for, river authorities. They really are. And they, they test, they monitor on a daily basis. So um, I personally am happy with the state of our, our water as far as from a quality standpoint in the environment. Uh, and Representative, I, I want to go back to Hurricane Harvey just um, real quickly and kind of build off of both the points that you guys were talking about, whether it be capturing the water. Or, um, but one of the things, you know, uh, has it changed the way watching what happened with Hurricane Harvey and, re and we'll balance that against the drought of 2011 where you had, you had lakes in East Texas that were, that were starving for water at that point. Has it changed uh, your view on how we should manage water, particularly in river basins, um, sort of as a system, or in reservoirs specifically? I mean, I, I can say that if, if I ever had a doubt about how strongly we need to pursue measures to capture as much of that water as we can, I don't anymore. I mean, it's just too much. There's too much at stake, it's too much water, and the truth is, relatively speaking, it's not hard. I mean, the, the, the science exists, the will exists. You know, obviously, a lot of things come down to money, but I mean, you know, everything with a good incentive will allow these things to happen, and I, I think that, for me, that's changed. I, I can tell you that I, I could not, as, as things were unfolding, you couldn't help but get caught up in the human part of it, you know, all the things that were happening, and the, so a lot of people that you knew, and, and you know, as we traveled to different parts of that, uh, of the state, you know, it, it just impacted you, but I could also think about it and watch the water just kind of run and say, you know, now I live, you know, it's funny, is I, I literally live on the Rio Grande, so I turn my back on, you know, a big river and surface water every day when I leave the ranch, and I, I, I can only imagine how it feels to know, you know, we have the Amistad, and so it opens up, and, and it's been a real good system for managing the water and the level of water in the river for a long time. But I guess that's it. I mean, I, I, I think that we have to we have to do more than pay lip service. And it was a shame, you know, and I won't get into all the issues regarding the governor's veto of that bill, but that was a good start. Ms. Zach, listen to an interview Poncho was on t talking about the the wall, the border wall, and I guess the proposal right now. He's so close to the river that actually he would be on the other side of the wall. Am I correct? Yeah. He so would have to climb him, the wall to come. Bring <laughs> <a> ladder. <laughs> he had to climb the water to go to the H-E-B. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, it, was, it was a good interview. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, two points. One is that I, I agree with Poncho. The, the, the science exists. The, I think the, um, the want, the, the need to do it obviously exists. I can tell you that city of Beaumont, uh, in and of itself wasn't really impacted that bad by the hurricane as opposed to, because we have a phenomenal drainage system. Um, so we weren't inundated with the water that other areas of Southeast Texas was, but 
our pump station for the city of Beaumont, which is about 120,000 people, is actually on the Orange County side of, of the Natchez. And it was, it was absolutely destroyed by floodwaters. So Beaumont did not have water for set. We had electricity, we had internet, we had TV, we had, we had no water. It was bizarre. Um, and I got my kids out of town. I was like, you can't have four boys and not shower. Just, there's, there's only so much a crisis I can handle, you know, at once. But, um, but no. So what the city of Beaumont did? There was it's a great story. Uh, we have a local um, uh, engineering slash fabrication. They're, they're pretty big, but they have, they were uh, they do all they build pumps, they build oil derricks, rigs, whatever you want, fracking devices, you name it. They, they did it all. Well, they had they had built an enormous pump for a country uh, for pardon me for a city in Argentina. And it was on the back of a um, back of a truck about to leave town to go to the port to get on a ship to go to Argentina. Well, that that thing got commandeered. It did not <laughs> leave the city of Beaumont. Um, they got their pump, but it was used. Um, so we put that pump on a skiff, and we put it in the Natchez, and we started pumping water from the Natchez into the treatment plant, which is a pretty good distance. And um, that's how we got the water back up and running. And it went that it, it was that way for several months. And um, so it can be done. There are pumps that exist that could pump tr enough water to to uh, satisfy the needs of 120,000 people for three or four months. I mean, certainly there's the the technology exists to pump that into an aquifer. No doubt about it. Um, but I, but one thing I'm really concerned about, and I'm not sure if this is what you're asking. It might be, but have an experience on uh, River Authority and have an experience with how these reservoirs are run, we do not need to have a knee-jerk reaction to how we release water from these reservoirs because of flooding. It is, it's very, very simple to say, well, why can't we just release it early? We know there's a storm coming. Start releasing the water. Well, if you asked, if you asked, <laughs> lead, uh, pardon me, if you asked, it's being River Authority, for you to drop 200,000 acre feet, for it to make a difference, that's a lot of water, by the way, 200,000, for you to drop 200,000, when do you need to start releasing it for it to be done in a controlled manner? Well, Dade, if the hurricane's coming in September, we need to start in May. So, let's start releasing water, and then there's no hurricane. And then you go into drought for two years, and you don't have those 200,000 acre feet, and it's gone, all right? That's a reality. If you try to release too much water, what do you do? You flood everyone even more because all your streams, all your tributaries are already full of water. Then you get 70 inches on top of that. Actually, you're better off cutting the water off and letting the river run dry <laughs> south of the reservoir when it rains like that. Then you at least have some extra storage capacity. The last thing you want to do is double that. So I'm sensitive to the people who went to bed, you know, from the, and I'm speaking to the Trinity River Authority, and they woke up and there's water in their house. I get that. I think there's a, they have some more silting issues, probably more than anything, and there's they have a lot of issues. But maybe they need to do some dredging, and maybe they maybe if that community wants to drop their storage and their capacity by 100,000 acre feet, we'll call it, that's their decision. But when they can't flush their toilets and brush their teeth the next year, that's also their decision. And we have a state water plan, and in it is is all the different capacities of, of different reservoirs. And if you want to take 100,000 acre feet out of that plan, you're going to have to replace it. You have to figure out something. I mean, there is a day of reckoning. Mm -hmm. Now, I can tell you we have two reservoirs about to come online in Texas at, at 134,000 acre feet, $1 billion to get that 134,000 acre feet. And those were started 20 years ago. So, you know, there's a high cost to doing this, mm -hmm. and there's a public safety cost to doing it. And we have to really think through that. And on top of all that, at the end of the day, like in the Natchez River, the Corps of Engineers runs the reservoir. It's their call, not the state legislature. It's Lita Ben. They have to follow a FERC permit because they are a power generation dam. FERC has to sign off on what they do and what they don't do. So I don't even know if we can do what people want us to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, a lay. A, Lakes, I mean, reservoirs are built for certain reasons. They're permitted for certain reasons. Power generation, you know. Nature, uh, the, the Sam Rayburn is for, is for consumption and use. It's not for power generation, and it's not. We can mitigate flooding. 
but that's not the primary purpose. So you can't just repurpose a dam in one session and think that problem your flood solved, your yeah. problem solved for a thousand year storm. And but that is a reality. There are and we talked about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure if you watch follow the news, but that that is a very that's a reality in Lake in, in um the Trinity River Authority in Lake Houston. I know Sylvester Turner, Mayor Turner wants the lake level drop, that's fine, but they gotta talk to TCEQ and figure out what's their long-term strategy for replacing that water. Right, and the, and the understanding that that water is all tied up in a, in a, in a permit, and so Absolutely. It's, it's accounted for, so yes. even just releasing it counts against that, that permit. Absolutely. And so so it, it creates some real, some real interesting challenges, and that's gonna lead me into, I think, the last question, uh, maybe the last question, because I'd like to leave a little bit of time for, for questions from you guys. Um, but building on that and sort of the discussion that I think has to happen regarding reservoirs after Hurricane Harvey, um, we've got a legislative session that's on the horizon. Uh, it's, uh, you know, be here before we know it. And so with the interim that's going on right now and the things that you guys are hearing, I'd like to hear maybe a little bit about where do you think the, the ledge is going to spend most of its time um, regarding water policy? Do you have any predictions as to where we're going to end up? Or are there things that, that um, maybe we're not thinking about? Or is it things that we've talked about today that, uh, that you think are going to be really getting most of the attention as we, as we move ahead? You know, I, I think we start out the session, and that, that's, nobody's ever really talking about water, you know, on a you know, you don't see those headlines often around the state in terms of the, but it, it becomes a big issue as the session moves along. But I, I sense that we're gonna be talking a little bit more about, and going back to Dade's comment about what a good job y'all do to make sure that people have good, safe drinking water. And that's, you know, I think a lot of what gets lost in the shuffle in these discussions is from the get to the go. And that means that, you know, when your tap turns on, you actually have something that, that's, that you can drink and that you can consume and that you can use for your industrial use and your agricultural use. And I think, I think we're gonna see more push on that because of the hurricane where you'll be talking about some community. And it, you know, it seems like, you know, you go again, and I hate to scapegoat, scapegoat Mississippi, but I will, nobody here's from Mississippi, are they? You can deny it if you want. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I was reading about communities that you would be surprised how many don't have good drinking water. I mean, just flat out don't have good, safe drinking water, and what a challenge is to do it. And I, I think Texas is a place where, because of people that have come before us, that that's, it's very rare to find that. Like, it's becoming less and less, or, or in other words, it's not something, you, there's a couple places, but I think we're working to fix those issues, and they're gonna get fixed, believe me. But I think as we move forward, people are gonna be more conscious of, of those issues, and I think I, we'll probably see more of that. I mean, I, I would expect we see the same bills, you know, uh, regarding interbasin, I mean, they're going to take another shot because they take shots, and that's okay. You know, maybe there's something about this bill that makes it palatable for you know someone in Dave's position that would make it palatable for me then, but probably not. But I I don't I don't really see some huge issue. I, I think we're going to keep moving in the direction to, and I don't want to use the, the word handcuff groundwater districts, but I think we're going to uh, go in a direction, generally speaking, uh, in creating environments where permits are not just denied just because they, they, need, they want to be denied. And I think we're going to have, there's more oversight, and I hate to use the word oversight, there's more of an opportunity for the person asking for the permit to get the permit. And you're not going to see these little prejudices, or you shouldn't see these little prejudices about where the water goes. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to continue to do that. That's probably mm -hmm. what I see. Well. We're going to have a new speaker, so I don't know what the committees will look like. That's true. If, we we if, might all be on Parks and Rec. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I might be on the, uh, you know, squirrel guard committee. Even now. You're going to do a great job on that. I know. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> I, I would enjoy the sleep, to be honest with you. But no, uh, so who, you know, who's got the gavel will decide who, who's on natural resources and who's the chairman. But if let's say it's Chairman Larson and he's back, and I'm sure the bills he lost to veto he would like to see those back. One of them being an ASR. <coughs> Pardon me. The other one was his WAM bill, mm -hmm. and this is something all the ur urban areas. You know, we talk about junior water rights, and in any way altering it, you can't really start a discussion unless you know what's actually in those rivers. And we have not done a WAM, which is a water availability model, in a very long time. So the discussion was fine. You want to talk about surface water and changing how we do it? 
what's in the basins? I mean, what, what's actually in the rivers? You know, let's see the data. So there was a bill to do that. It got vetoed. So we don't have that data. Um, and I think know. to redo that, if I remember correctly, it costs about seven million dollars to do to pay for sure. all the. Sure. There is a fiscal note, and we're going to be broke next session. By the way, um, there's no money. Uh, <laughs> so anything with a fiscal note like that might be difficult. Uh, the other thing is, by the way, I had two bills vetoed. So between the chairman and vice chairman of National Resources, we represented about 15 percent of all the vetoes. I'm very proud of that. And, <laughs> And um, I don't know why I didn't do anything. I know what Lyle did. I didn't do anything. <laughs> Everyone knows what Lyle did. And it was very obvious. But I was surprised about my two vetoes. But anyway, um, I've always well, wanted to get. That's guilt by association. Exactly. Right there. I always wanted to uh, have a bill vetoed. I just, I, I'm surprised to have not two. Not that one. No, not that one, then. <laughs> but no, I do think that we'll, just like last time, probably 80% of what we do is groundwater legislation. We'll probably I'd see that as well. I can tell you that. If there is a discussion about uh, fallout from Harvey and reservoirs and how they were operated, and um, you know we're 54 days away from another hurricane season, knock on wood. Um, but if we see a repeat of any of that, sure that could gain steam. I think hopefully between now and session, uh, our Houston friends will and Trinity River will kind of figure out what's best for them, and they may have the funding already to do the dredging. So hopefully that issue will go away because I really don't think it's it's the right time to talk about it, but. Um, but yeah, I do. I do. I would like to see Chairman Larson's uh, bills. Those were all great bills, and they are needed for the next step. And so we kind of lost a couple of years on that. Um, but like I said, anything that costs money is going to be difficult as well. And I'll tell you a, a funny story about you know, Dave was talking about the focus about 80% on groundwater districts. It was two sessions ago. I was trying to pass this groundwater bill, and it there were so many things and moving parts <coughs> in it, and a lot of different parties and and. Uh, I think Ed McCarthy was here, I think saw him before. Ed was involved in that. And uh, so it, a lot was going on and we came to a point where we thought we had a deal and we had so many witnesses that were gonna testify on this and <laughs> date last. But it was, uh, it, it was hard. And it, at the end of the day, it didn't happen. It didn't get done and it, again, I, look, most of these groundwater districts, the, the, the writing and it's just chapter 36, you just about this thick, but mine was like that, right? So the bill fails, and the following week we have another committee hearing, and Jeannie Morrison comes in, and she creates a groundwater district. I want to say it was in like five minutes. And so <laughs> she gets up there, and like, there's nothing in the bill other than it's chapter 36, <laughs> go form it. Nobody, test, nobody showed up to testify, nobody. And uh, so I just sat there kind of dumbfounded. And so after I was like, Jeannie, what happened? She's like, I don't know, they asked me to do this. I did. And, the, and the, di the difference or the reason is, is there's no groundwater over there, so yeah. nobody cared. <laughs> and I was like, man, I wish it was like that. But I, I, it was um, yeah. everything that has to do with water is maddeningly, maddeningly frustrating. Mm -hmm. 